in art. I, I formerly of Fort McMurray and then Lac La Biche and now St. Albert. And uh, boy, I'm so thankful that you guys all showed up here. I, I got a friend from Lac La Biche that I used to work with and play with out there. And it's just so good to see you guys, man. I'm just, I'm blessed to see you. I really, I mean, I, uh, it's been a long road, you know, I am, I'm 74 years old and uh, I've been having a good time the last 30 years because I, 30 years ago I gave my life to Jesus, but it wasn't always this uh, this kind of a show. I, uh, I was born in Edmonton, uh, right in the Edmonton Center, right on Skid Row, man, you know, and raised on Skid Row the first 10 years of my life. And uh, I was in reform school twice before I was 10. Things were going kind of sideways for me and my family. My dad was a drinker, and uh, we had like, I don't know, five kids in the family. And, yeah. <laughs> so dad moved us away, we moved to a small town, and uh, I got a taste of small town life, and I liked that a lot better. I got to know farm life a little bit, and I liked that better than the city, too. And I thought I was kind of a tough street kid, raised, raised on the streets of Edmonton, right? But when I met up with a country boy, he gave me a licking real quick, you know. <laughs> and, and, we, and then we became good friends, you know, me and, me and Bobby. Yeah, you know, we're still good friends. Actually, he sent me a, a, a message on Facebook today. He says, God bless you, Don. Looks good on you. Keep on doing what you're doing. That's a friend, you know. I've known him for 64 years. And we're still, uh, still kicking together. So I got a lot of those friends that are still kicking, you know. And that's awesome to me. That's a blessing. To live this long, I never, you know, when I, I think you can all relate to this. When we were younger, we never thought we could live this long. <laughs> Maybe I'd take better, better care of myself if I had. But, uh, no, here we are. This is what you get. So, thank God for that. So, um, anyways, you know, uh, I don't really need these notes. I'm not going to keep looking back. I'm just going to tell you about how my life went. In. And, and uh, but it, we lived in a lodge in this little town lodge pool, like I said, for three years, Cynthia for one year. Moved back to Edmonton when I was 14. And uh, I didn't mind school, but I was you know, not too interested in school. And by the time I was 16, I was drinking already. And by the time I was 17, I was finished with school. I, uh, I went to work after grade 11 and uh, bought a car and I had money in the bank and I didn't see any need to head back to school for grade 12. So I just carried on with my life and just started working and drinking and partying and doing what you know teenagers do and in my early 20s too the same thing and, and uh, I was back in Edmonton at this time and growing up in the cities and I remember when I was a little guy I was walking down the alleys of, of, of Edmonton Center or downtown Edmonton and, and uh, you know Ray and Ray with Ray and Marco there he was in the same area we never crossed paths but we went to the same areas for years and I never got to know him. I got to know him now, I'm sure about it yet. But uh, he's got a good story too. So I'm going down this alley and here's five or six biker guys in, in behind this garage. All their bikes are all sitting there. And I'm walking by, I'm about 10, right? And I look at these guys and wow, these are cool. Asphalt dragons, they were called. <laughs> and I went, woo! And they invited me in to show me some stuff and, you know, kind of pounded me around a little bit. Well, I felt like I belonged there. <laughs> I liked it. That was an impression on me early in my life. So, you know, and then we moved away, like I said, for three or four years into a small town and came back to Edmonton when I was 14, 15. Uh, finished high school. Uh, as far as I was concerned, I was finished high school. And, uh, and just got into the world, got into working, and and, uh, and I like bikes because of those guys. I, I like bikes. I had small bikes when I was younger, and a Honda, and a 50, and a 250 Suzuki, and then a 650 BSA, then an 850 Norton, and I was climbing up the ladder, man, you know? And uh, I, I just kind of bumped around for a lot of years at, in that kind of state of mind, I learned, learning how to party and drink and work and, you know, cope with the whole thing of life. And, Never having a serious relationship, just hit and miss, hit and miss all the time. And never had anything to do with God at all. Just uh, the odd funeral or the odd wedding, I know there was something about God would be sad. Or, and uh, it didn't have much effect on me. I didn't have anything to do. I, so I was just kind of a freewheeler. You know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I just... Uh, I just enjoyed how I was living then. I didn't have any thoughts about how I could be any better. And this is it. This is what I get. You know, this is my influences of young age was drinking and partying and gangs and clubs and, and uh, thought, well, I'm just going to do that, you know, and 
Uh, my dad was a truck driver, and he taught me how to drive a truck, so that's what I did for a living. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I did, this went on for till my early 20s. And then I, uh, I actually joined a club in the early 20s, in 1972. I, I, I tied, tied in with a club. I, I, was, I, I struck for them for about two years, and I finally got full patch, and I rolled with them for eight years. And, uh, I never had anything that I felt that I could belong to. I never felt like I had any support anywhere in the world. It just people would always let you down, or they'd want something, or they'd take something, or take advantage, or lie to you. And I, I don't know, I just, I didn't have anything that I could depend on. But when I got this brotherhood going on in the club, I felt like I had something I could really depend on, really lean on. And there was a brotherhood in those days. We were tight. I mean, if you if you bothered one, you bothered all of us. And that was bottom line. You, you don't touch the brothers. You don't touch the brothers, you don't touch the patch. You don't touch the bike. And I felt, this is, I, I could live here. I could do this. And I would have died for any of them at any time at that point in my life. Because this is the most important thing. I'm moving on into my 30s now with this club. As it turned out, the big guys, Hells Angels, uh, came into the area, Edmonton, and they they said they, they shut everybody down. They shut all the clubs, they patched over, and they shut all the clubs down, and only HA was left. And our club was one of the clubs, too, that was shut down. Well, we had some difference of opinion, but at the end of the day, you know, what are you going to do? We, we had to shut her down. But that group stayed together, and they're still together today. They still get together twice a year for a celebration, and it's good. And so I, I still appreciate all those old brothers. We've lost a couple along the way, but, you know, thanks to the Lord, we managed to lead them almost on their deathbeds to Jesus. And that's, hey, you know what? That's what, that's, you know, anyway, so, we, so when I was about 32, uh, a friend of mine who owned, who had started a Harley shop in Fort Mac called me and said he'd get somebody to work in the back for him. He couldn't handle it all himself. Just him and my sister were running the whole show up there. And he had opened a shop, a uh, Harley Davidson franchise called B Twin Cycle. So I went up to work for him for a summer. And, and so I worked the whole summer. And at the end of the summer, he gave me a brand new Harley Davidson. I didn't get any wages the whole summer. I just worked and got that bike at the end of the summer. And uh, But then he had signed me up with Fairview College to go to college to, for motorcycle mechanics for that fall. So, oh, okay. So I, what I did, what, the shop was shutting down for winter anyway, pretty much. And I don't know, okay, so I go there. I go to Fairview College. and I had a fine time at college, let me tell you. I went, Ooh. Anyways, uh, we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I finished. Uh, I finished in, in January with the college course, and then come back to Fort McMurray, drove a cab till spring, and then back in the shop all summer. Did that for a couple of years, and then the shop the shop shut down because uh, the the Suncor up there went on strike, and everybody was holding on their money, and he wasn't making enough money to keep the doors open in the shop, so he shut the shop down, and that shut my job down. But by then I was connected to people at the St. Crude operation there in the mines. And I got a job on with them in 1985. I started with St. Crude, Canada, in Fort Mac. And uh, whoa, what a good job. I was running heavy equipment, the biggest equipment in the world. And good money and shift work. And I took a while to get used to it, but it wasn't terrible. And I did it. But I never stopped the drinking and the partying and the drugs. As a matter of fact, as the money came in, the better the money, the more the drugs. It seemed like, and the higher the quality. <laughs> and uh, I got pretty wired. I got so bad, I got so bad that I actually got fired from that job. And when I got fired from there, I knew I'd lost something really good, something really important, something that I could have a kind of a foundation for my future, you know, for whatever it might look like uh, financially. And I felt a sense of loss, but they paid me a big uh, bunch of separation money too to, to get rid of me, you know, because they got to be careful when they fire you in those big outfits in case you come back for false or <laughs> false dismissal or whatever. Anyway, they gave me a big lump of cash. So for that year, that was 1992, eh, I <laughs> I just took my motorcycle and hooked up with Kathy and spent the whole summer just spending that money and having a good time. And Kathy and I had a really good time. 
And uh, then we got back to Fort Mac, and uh, we lived, moved in together. I was living in an apartment in the towers in Fort McMurray before that, but we moved into a trailer, bought the trailer. We renovated it, drywalled it, made it nice. And me and Kathy were blessed with a little boy, and that was Robbie. Now, Robbie was, uh, he wasn't developing properly with Kathy, and Kathy was kind of sick too, and uh, so she, uh, late in her pregnancy, she had to go stay at the hospital in Edmonton for two and a half months, just, and rest, because she needed, Robbie needed her energy and her strength to develop it because he wasn't doing well. What it was, was he had gastroschisis, which is his stomach wall and the front didn't develop. So his intestines and his bowel was outside of his, out of his body, out of the ribcage. Anyway, he got born four pounds, four ounces, little skinny, tiny little fingers. And my God, I thought, how's that little guy ever going to amount to anything? But, but here's the deal, man, oh man. Kathy and I were not on, we were getting, we we're kind of getting on rough water there because I wasn't behaving right. I wasn't behaving, I wasn't showing up. I was disappearing for days and still getting high and, and not being responsible at all, really. And uh, it, but when, she, when the baby was born, I wanted to be there. So I was there. The doctor said, well, okay, but you know, you, this is what you're up against, man. You know, here, you're going to see this baby come up without his stomach wall and his intestines are going to be outside of him, you know. And yeah, 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 whatever, you know, right here, I can handle it. So anyways, I'm, sitting, I'm standing there watching this baby be born. <laughs> and out it comes. And it's, I didn't even notice this. I'd seen that the, the stomach was out of him and that, you know. But I was like, whoa. I went, and the doc, come, he took me by the shoulder. He said, you want to sit down, Don? I, I see that. I told you this is going to be rough. I didn't know. It's not, it's not what's the problem with him. It's seeing a life start. A brand new life. It struck me as, like, you know, I've been around now for, what was I, 30 32 years old, and it never struck me life, never, I never thought about life. I just lived day to day and just pounded, right? But uh, to see this baby born, and it was mine, I was taken. I, I think I felt love, you know, it was like a genuine kind. And then I felt a great appreciation for Kathy, for his mother, too. And, oh, man, I got I to gotta make some changes, man, you know? So anyway, we, Kathy had to stay, he had to stay in intensive care for how long? Two months? Six weeks? Five weeks? He was in intensive care. Because he was only four pounds. It's the tiniest thing. I couldn't hold him. I was scared to hold him. I thought I'd break him. But uh, finally, uh, I got to, uh, you know, I mean, it led up to it. But I finally got to hold him all wrapped up in his rags. And, 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 and he put his little hand out and he got a hold of my finger. And I couldn't believe the strength in that little hand. Man, I was like, what? This guy's got something going on here, man. And, and again, I, oh, I love this guy. Right? I love this baby. So anyway, Kathy and Robbie came back home and settled into the trailer. And I was working a steady job. But on days off, man, I was gone. You know, I was just rocking and rolling, chasing the drugs and drinking and fighting and cruising and not showing up for days on end. And she was had no support. I mean, she had a place to live, and I was, you know, buying groceries and stuff. But I wasn't there for her and him. She finally said, I, "I'm not putting up with this." She left. She moved into an apartment. She got a job. Took Robbie, and it struck me again as, you know, what? I lost something very important here again, didn't I? Just because of this stupid alcoholism and drug addiction. Is it worth it? I think, man, I, I'm not so sure it is anymore. I'm not so sure. Anymore. And I just slowly been getting worse and worse. I was on the cocaine pretty hard, right? And a lot of my friends had fallen away because I was really not trustworthy at that point. And uh, my family had told me, you know, we're gone. Don't even come around us anymore if you're going to be doing that stuff. We don't want you. Huh? What? I felt like I was really alone and left to my own <coughs> devices. And I realized, I, thought, I started thinking, man, you know, I gotta make some changes. So I, I went to AA a couple of times, and I went to NA a couple of times, and I didn't get anything. I just, there's nothing here for me that'll help. I took some counseling, secular counseling, which is like worldly counseling. Nothing, nothing. I just carried on doing what I was doing. 
but I wanted to change. And the harder I tried to change, the worse I got. The worse I got. And, and the easier it came. And I'd stop for a couple of days and I'd straighten out. Somebody would knock on the door and have a big bag of dough with a big case of beer. And there we go again. Gone for days. I kept telling Kathy I wanted to come back. I wanted to come back. Like, what do you want me to come back for? I'm not coming back to that. I'm not putting up with that. You know, you, you're on your own. I, she said, I, I, I'm going to church now. <laughs> she was raised in church, and, and of course she went, fell away from there for a few years after during high school and after high school. But and then she met me. Of course, I didn't help that situation either. But but she'd gone back to, to church because she knew there was a foundation there for her, which I didn't have no idea, but I had no clue. And. Uh, she said, that's what you need to do. You need to find Jesus in your life. You, know, you need to come to church. And I said, no, no, no. That's not for guys like me. That is not, that's not a set. That, that's for people that don't suit and tie, and they go and they sing those songs, and, and they laugh and dance and pray around, and, you know, they go knock on your door and try to shove paper in your face, and I mean, those guys, that ain't me, man. I'm a biker. I'm a biker, and there ain't no room in church for a biker, you know. Said, oh, yeah, there is, she said. He loves everybody. He sees everybody the same. God sees everybody the same. I said, really? Like he, he, he sees me as the same as this preacher up here on this podium or, or that bum down on the street. You know, he sees me as the same. Yeah, we're all equal in the eyes of the Lord. Said, well, well, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah, I think I'm starting to get it. And I wanted her back and I wanted to be a father to Rob. And so I tried hard to stop, but it just got worse. And so one Sunday, I, for some reason, I had I felt pretty good. You know, I had, wasn't too hungover and stuff, and so I went to church. And uh, I was welcomed in there. I didn't think I'd even make it through the door. But I was welcomed in, because I had a rep, man, people in Fort Mac knew who Trooper was, and he had a bad rep, man, he was bad. It's bad news coming and going, he was bad. And I think I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get a real negative, reaction or reception from church. But now I walked in and hey, how you doing? Shaking hand, pat in the back. Yeah, I know you and I've seen you. And I seen some guys in there I didn't even know went to church were in there. I said, well, yeah, I know you guys, what are you doing here? Well, we go to church, you know. I said, okay, well, all right. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? So so I explained, well, I kind of, that's kind of okay. I kind of, I kind of dig this. And I was missing my brothers, you know, the guys that I thought I could depend on and, and live with, you know, and, and, and they had my back. And, uh, I was feeling kind of lonely and cast out. So on Sundays, if I wasn't working and if I was clear, I would go to church and I would hear what they would do. But, you know, and then the next day I'd go off on a three day burn or something, some crack house somewhere, and then straighten out for a couple of days and go back to work. And uh, it was just a, a nightmare, a cycle, just round and round and round. But all the time I was going round and round, I was going down, down, down getting sicker and weaker and more in debt and uh, to a point where I didn't see that I was going to make it a lot much longer with my, in my life anymore. I, so one, one Sunday I went to the church and the pastor that was a regular pastor at that church had had to move away. They had some trouble with the family and they had just made a decision to leave Fort McMurray. That little tiny church that I would attend with Kathy was a Native Christian Fellowship church down by the river. And it was backed up by the Alliance Church up on the hill in Thickwood at Fort Mac. So they'd send a, an elder from that church down to the Middle Native Fellowship Church to cover for the pastor that had left. So I come to church this Sunday. And I'm pretty worldly yet, man, you know, like, and I, I, I discriminate, you know, and I don't like nobody to think white right and Harley Davidson. No offense to anybody. But that's how I was. That was my thought process. And here's this guy up there. He's preaching, and he's a East Indian. And he's preaching the gospel. And his name is John. And I come in and what's this guy doing here? Man! But I, you know, I just felt this function to sit down and listen. So I go, oh. So I sit, and I listen, and this guy's talking about how Jesus loves us, how he went to the cross for us, how he died for us, how he thought of us when we were on the cross, how he sacrificed himself for me, for you, for sin. 
and offered this free gift of salvation, paying a price you couldn't pay with his life. I thought, it's pretty cool, isn't it? And I, it, it struck me, as, you know, it struck me, this is true. It's true. I kind of been hearing, you know, that along the times I went to church, but this, it, it came in, it went in that time. For the Lord had opened my eyes and heart to hear it. And I thought, well, man, that's profound. I got to go tell this guy he, he, he preached a good message. I'm going to go shake his hand. And I don't like this guy. He's, and normally, I don't like these people. <laughs> so I'm making my way up to the front to meet this guy. And I'm just like going, I'm going, no, no, no. But I got to go. It's like the devil's pushing me or the enemy. Or I don't know who was pushing me. I know now it was God pushing me. And I'm going, no, but I go. And I take his hand and I look at him and I say, and he's kind of looking at me like, who's this guy coming up the aisle? Big beard and hair and, you know, scary looking thing. And uh, I just take his hand and I start to shake his hand and he melts and I melt and we're hugging each other. <laughs> I go, what is going on here? And the man says, you know, I, the Lord put love in my heart for you. And I said, I, I think I got that too. <laughs> Holy smokes. I said, this God thing really works. It's crazy. So, and it was, so we became great friends. I went out to his house for supper and prayers and Bible studies. And it, we turned into really good friends, me and John. So then I'm thinking, okay, this is a pretty cool thing. I'm feeling something in this church that I can't put my finger on. But I know in my heart that it feels right. It feels good. And, and, but I can't name it. But it's got my interest now. So anyway, another week goes by, and I go do so. I work for a week, and then I'm off for a week. So I get drunk, and then I'm off and work for a week, and I'm off for enough for another week, and get loaded up again. And meanwhile, Kathy's still not happy with my actions, but she was interested in me having more of an interest in church, and so. Finally, one time, I, I, I went too far. Uh, I was at a crack house for three days. Came out, I went in with lots of money, came out owing money and all that is, and really went, went wild. And wound up back at my little trailer down in the waterways there in Fort Mac, but on the floor. I woke up, but that's all I could do was just kind of come conscious. I was laying on the floor, and I couldn't even lift my head. And I was burning, man. Just burning up. And then, and then I'd get frozen hot and shiver it and just tingling going up and down my body. And, and my heart was racing so fast I thought it was going to come right out of my chest. And I couldn't breathe. I, just, uh, uh, I could hardly get a breath. I thought, oh boy, I did it this time, man. I'm done. I'm going to die right here on the floor. And I'm pretty sure I was finished. And I started thinking, like in my heart, I started crying, like, Lord. I want to, Robbie needs a dad, Kathy needs a man, I need help, I need your help, Only I, I don't know where to go, I've, been, I've, I've tried everything I know in the world to try to get straightened out, I'm addicted, and I can't get over it, and, and I need help, I need something, and I need you to help, I think you can help me, I think what I've been feeling is you've got some power in Florida, you can make me love that guy on the podium like that, that's change in me, and I don't do change good Lord, but I, I know I can really feel that you love me or something, or something. Because I don't know, but I know this, Lord, if you'll, if you'll get me past this, I'll try to be a better man for Robbie and a better man for Kathy. And I could go on about how long it took to recover, but it took some time, like five or six days. But I finally got on my feet and got some food in me and, and called Kathy and told her what I had done. And she said, oh my God, you gave your life to Jesus. You, you just asked me in, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did. She was going to come to church and tell everybody. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I ain't telling anybody. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, so I go to church. I, <laughs> so I tell everybody at church, and they, they, they're clapping, and coming over and clapping me on the back, and shake hands, congratulations, man, you're in, you're in. In where, man? I said, no, you're, you're Jesus. You accept Jesus as your Savior? I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said, well, don't you know? I said, well, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't really know, but I mean, they said, well, say this prayer. And he said, they led me into a salvation prayer, and I felt some closure. And I felt that strange thing again that I couldn't put my finger on. Now, what the world is that? 
And uh, it finally came to me. It was, it was love. It wasn't the kind of love like, you know, I love my dog, I love my bike, I love, I love having a beer, I love the sunshine, you know. I love, but it was God's love and he put it inside me. He put, he put like, just an amazing sense of value in me because I was a wreck. I mean, there was nothing left in me. I mean, I should have died there on that floor. I'm absolutely positive. But I recognized that there was this love. And then I got this sense of, I'm going to learn about this. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to learn who this God is and what he does and why. What is this? Because this is, I could see that there was going to be some support here, like I was looking for in the club, only something stronger. I felt a sense of foundation being developed. And I'm a man, because this could be real. This could be, this could be real. So I started seeking them a bit, praying, and whatever. I didn't know how to pray, man. You know, I just, hey, God, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think I'd like to get to know you better. I think you got something that I need. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but could you kind of lead me and show me? I'm going to read your book. Here you got a good book right here. Right? This is it's supposed to all be all the answers right in this guy right here. So, okay, well, uh, where do I start? And somebody told me to start in the book of John. So I just read John, and oh, man, I said, whoa, hey, that's cool. I, I, I started thinking, that's true. I kept saying, that's true. Well, and I read that. Oh, that's true. Jesus loves you. Yeah, that's true. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, that's true. And uh, he died for you. Yeah, that's for me. What was he thinking? What he, what, why would he think of me or anybody else here? But he did. He was. And it was real. And a month went by. And something struck me. I don't have a craving for a drink or a drug. When I asked him on the floor, he, I got healed right there. And I've been clean and sober for 32 years. Hey, that's God, man. That's God right there. Kathy and I got back together. We actually moved away from Fort McMurray because there was a lot too much influence there and I didn't want to get pulled back in, you know. We lost all our friends that had any kind of drug affiliation with us. No, no, we had nothing in common anymore. Had new friends that were Christian folk. Pulled out of uh, Fort Mac. We had a couple thousand dollars to our name and an old motor home. And a baby and Kathy and me. <laughs> and we pulled out. We, we just got rid of everything, put the trailer up for sale. And hit the road. Lord, I don't know where you're taking us, but I got to get out of here. And uh, we hit the road. And a long story short, again, we wound up in Grand Prairie. Very circuitous. I'm down through BC and heading for Vancouver. <laughs> but anyway, wound up in the fall in, uh, in Grand Prairie. And got blessed there. Had another baby there. Joshie was born there. I joined the CMA there. Uh, that was Art Potter and his group up there in Grand Prairie. And they've been praying. They've been together for a while as a chapter up there. And they've been praying, Lord, send us somebody that's a real biker with a history. <laughs> well, this is what they got, man, you know. <laughs> so they invited us to their church. And, well, when we walked into that church, like me and Kath, you know, I had long hair and whiskers and tattoos, obviously, or two, and had a brand pretty new baby, you know, and Robbie was only like three or four, and we weren't married, you know, and we're claiming to be Christians, and uh, we walk into this church, and people are going, oh, God, what's that over there, you know, they're, they're looking at us like we got three hands, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I said, yeah, don't worry about that, Kathy. According to the Lord, uh, we're just as welcome here as anybody else. This is his house, this is our house. We're okay here. But she, you know, she, she felt the rejection hard. It was really hard for Kathy, really tough. But uh, we had, they had a deal there where if you had kids in the, in the, in the care system there, when I mean, you were going to church and went with the, what was it called? Nursery or what? Not nursery. Nursery, yeah. Then you, if you had a child in there, then you had to do a, a, a turn. In, in, the, in the nursery. When your name came up, you had to go do nursery on a Sunday instead of go to church. So I come in, I come in 
one Sunday morning and uh, I'm ready to go to church. I want to hear, because I'm on fire now. I want to hear about God and Holy Spirit and all this good stuff. Good preaching going on, good church. And fun with the people because I can freak them out pretty easy, right? <laughs> They're looking at you, walk over, hey, I'm Don, shake one hand, man. <laughs> well, it broke down some walls. But then she says, we got to do nursery today. I go, what? No, no, I didn't come here to do no nursery, baby. I, I am going to church. No, you're going to nursery. So, okay, I guess. So I go in there, and she's in there, and there's a bunch of little kids running around about this high. And I said, what do we do? So the one was crying. I said, what do you do? I said, she said, pick them up, pick her up. You know, they, they got diapers and stuff, right? And all that. <laughs> but anyways, I pick her up, and she stops crying. Little curly-haired, blue-eyed baby. And so I, I talked with her, and well, okay, this is great, it's kind of cool. So I calm her down and talk to another couple of kids. And then they're playing over there. They got a little table set up, little tiny chairs, and little plates and little cups, and they're having a little tea party. And they say, You got to come here and have tea with us. And I go, What, Kathy, what should I do? Just go have tea with them. <laughs> Man, you know, like, okay, look at it. <laughs> You know, like I'm 30 some odd years old and I've been hardcore and I, you know, I think I'm hardcore. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, anyway, I want to go sit with these little baby kids and pretend that. So I go sit on this little tiny chair and just take a little cup and, you know, have, have tea with these kids. And they're just loving it. They're loving it. And I made a good, I made a good uh, impression on the kids. Anyway, church is over. And then people come and get their kids and take them back downstairs into the foyer and I, we go down. And, uh, and uh, all the people are still kind of milling around, visiting and talking and everything. And that little curly-haired baby girl with the big eyes, big blue eyes, she sees me come running across the foyer. <laughs> and her parents go, <laughs> And I pick her up and I grab her. Oh, I'm hugging her and she's holding on to me and I take her back to her, her mom and said, this is yours, she's great. And said, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Give me my baby, you know. And I go, no, thanks. You know? And I say to the man, hey, hi, how are you doing? What's your name? I shake his hand and he go like, oh, what is this? It took a while, but we broke down, we broke down the walls there and uh, got to be known, got to be loved. Got busy with that chapter of the CMA won some souls out that way, put on a couple of big parties like pig roasts and runs up there, polar runs. We had some big fun. Enjoyed, enjoyed. It took a while to get reestablished. I had no credit. I had no, nothing. I ruined it all with my attitude and spent all my money and got rid of everything. Ruined my finances. So anyways, uh, we just got settled out. We were living in a little bit of a shack in Grand Prairie. It was pretty cold little house, and you only had one pane of glass. And, oh, the wind would blow right through that place. And anyways, we spent the winter in there. And then when Josh was born, Kathy didn't want us to live in that dirty little house, so we managed to convey some people to rent to us. Uh, we were still not very acceptable looking, but in our hearts we were great, and in God's eyes we were amazing. And 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 and, and, and in the chapter's names, we were we were a godsend, man. You know, <laughs> so so uh, we managed to get this duplex rented. Oh, it's nice. It was all fresh and painted. And I thought this is good. You got clean carpet for the baby. You know, okay. We just get settled into it, and the Lord's moving on us. You got to go back to Fort McMurray. No, I don't think so. So I fought it for about a month. I fought it. And finally, I said to Kathy, I said, I've got to tell you something. I think the Lord's talking to me about something. She said, what is it? And I, I said, uh, I think he wants us to go back to Fort Mac. She said, me too. I'm here in the same thing. No. So I gave notice of my job. I gave notice for the, two, the, 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 the duplex. And within a month, we were back in Fort Mac. Landed there with an old beat up van. Couple of old sticks of furniture. Lost our dog on the way there. Had a flat tire. While I was changing the flat, the dog got lost, and we never, never seen it since. Made it back to Fort Mac. Had to go live with her dad. But I said to Kathy, "If we're going back to Fort McMurray, I'm going to tell the Lord that I need two things. I need a job and a place to live, because I got a family and I, I care about my family and I love them, and I want to serve the Lord. But you know what? 
That's two things I'm going to ask the Lord for. And two phone calls, I had a job and a place to live. <laughs> so we go back to Fort McMurray, we move in with her father. Now that's a pride step right there. I mean, for a man to say, hey, father-in-law, can I move into your house? I got no place to live and, you know, whatever. But he took us in. And uh, he was pretty gracious about it, you know, and he was single then too. And we worked our way into that and we, we, uh, we got approached by a pastor there in Fort Mac to, to take on this, the beginning of a new chapter of CMA up there. And decided that we would help do that. And uh, another man named Chuck had gone up there and, and sort of initially tried to get it going. And he was a trucker. And on his way back home from Fort Mac, he had a heart attack and died on the highway. So his wife was a sister-in-law to the pastor, and she asked if we could carry on Chuck's reign. And Pastor Jim came and asked us if we would be interested in trying to pick it up. So we went and picked it up and took off with it. And in no time, we had like 18, 20 members. And we were working hard and we were attending functions and, and praising the Lord and witnessing all over the place. And we put on a huge pig roast and rodeo up there. And, uh, you know, it was just God's hand in all of it. And we fed 300 people. I mean, that's a ton of people, but just by the grace of God, we, 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 made, we made that kind of an impact on Fort McMurray. And, and it went, it was super, it was all God, it was all God, man, oh man. And so we just continued going that way. And I didn't even have a, bike, a motorcycle yet up there. I got, I'm in a motorcycle ministry, but I didn't have a, I didn't have a dime. I mean, I, had, I was making good money because I was working for a contractor and running heavy equipment. I was making good money, but I had no credit, so I couldn't buy a house. I couldn't. I couldn't even buy a toothbrush on credit. The local Harley owner, Harley shop owner, is a new, a different fellow. Not the guy I went to work for. He was an SKP from Czechoslovakia. He uh, he was having trouble with the local riders and with the hog chapter, and he had to lay down the law. And so everybody up there that wrote hard was kind of rejecting him and his wife. So they didn't have any friends and they felt lonely and they felt rejected. And, and uh, Milan and I didn't get along very good before I found Jesus or before Jesus found me. And as a matter of fact, he would leave the office or leave the shop when I came in because he didn't want to deal with me. It was that bad. And, oh, troopers here. Oh, God. And he'd go to the door. And uh, I just came for some parts, which is a problem. Anyways. Well, I'm going to saved, and I'm going back to Fort Mac, and uh, so I'm going to go tell the land about what happened to me. So I walk in, and he says, oh, it's you. I said, hold on. Don't be going running away. I want to go in the office. I want to talk to you. Really? Said, yeah. It's okay. Okay, he says. So we go in. We sit down at the office, in the office, and I told him all about Jesus and how I changed. And he said, yeah. Yeah, I see a difference in you. You know, he got quite the action. Yeah, I see a difference in you, Don. True, true, so I said, well, it is, God makes a difference, people. God makes a difference. God has changed my life, my land. And, you know, within a year, he was saved, and his wife was saved. Hey, yeah, yeah. But here's the kicker. With Milan, he said, we invited him to a couple of functions that we put on for CMA, and the people just loved on him. And he wasn't used to getting loved on. He was used to getting rejected, you know, pushed away. Abusively, I mean, swearing and swinging at him and that kind of junk. Anyways, he felt that love get poured onto him, and he liked it. And he came to me one day and he said, "Tober, how can you be in motorcycle ministry when you don't even have a motorcycle?" I said, "Well, Milan is like this. I don't have any. I can't buy one. I got no credit. I, I I'd like to have a motorcycle, but you know how it is." And he said, "Yeah, I know you're working good. You have money. You have, you have you have some down payment for one." I said, "Yeah." He said, okay, make an application out for a loan for Harley Credit and see what happens. I said, man, I can already tell you what's going to happen. They're going to kick it out the door. And he said, do it anyway. So I made an application. It came back not approved. No, no, no credit rating. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to do something for you. I've been in this business 13 years. And even for my brother, who I escaped Czechoslovakia from with, well, I would not co-sign for him, but on this form with Harley Davidson credit on the bottom, there's a part where I can sign responsibility for this sale, for the for the finances. 
I said, you do that for me? He said, yeah, I'm going to do that for you. I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> I said, I know why. <laughs> and then, uh, so he said, which one do you want? I said, what do you mean? I said, anything on the floor. So I picked a brand new road king. Well, actually, it was his, his demo, but it was a beauty. So I, so I got a brand new road king. And I'm, and I'm thinking, man, that, that's pretty great. You know, I, I got a brand new motorcycle and I can't even buy a toothbrush on credit. This is pretty great. I had a payment and I was just making the payment because I was making good money. And within a year, I got a letter in the mail from Visa and they had a Harley Davidson Visa credit card in my, with my name on it. So that helped me start to rebuild my financial credibility. God was working on this wreck and returning what he says, I will return what the locusts have taken. What's been stolen from you will be returned and more. So here's, here's how it worked out. The credit got rebuilt and eventually I got offered my job back at Syncre. Now I could go on to tell you all about that, but time is an issue here. But in a long story short, a guy stood up for me with the management of St. Group and said, and he was well known and well placed up there in the high places. And they got to know him and he was a Christian man. And he said, if you don't hire him back, I'm leaving. And his manager said, no, you've got to be kidding, Pat, come on. And he said, no, this is the way it is. I got my briefcase right there. It's full of my stuff. Good. So they had a big meeting and they decided to bring that Don guy back in. When I got fired the first time, I went to, after a year of running around and playing with Kathy and all kinds of craziness, I went back to work for, for, an or, for a contractor on the St. Crude site, but I wasn't allowed to leave the quadrant that they were contracted to work in. That's how blackballed I was. He said, no way, don't let him get near to anything any near our operations, because they figured I'm going to blow something up. I could care less what they were doing, but that was, that's how bad it was. And they turned it around to a point where they rehired me as a full-time equipment operator on a different team that I was on before, and, and with full pay that where I was when I, when I left. They returned, God returned what had been stolen from me, but the, the real impressive thing is that started a program that was called a Fresh Start, right? Second Chance program that gave a lot of people that had drug issues and drinking issues opportunity to go get addiction care and counseling, or even if they had been fired, if they were willing to, to clean up, they'd hire them back. So a lot of people come back on that. And that was God again, setting up something in place to help people. So pretty soon we had Kathy's father wanted to get remarried and he needed some money, so he financed his whole house. He had it paid for it. And he took $10,000 out of that and he had to give his ex-wife some. And he said to us, if we will assume his mortgage, we can have the house. Because <laughs> there's no way you can get a mortgage with my credit. And the next thing, so, so now we got our name on a mortgage, we got our name on a title, and we got our name on a brand new Harley Davidson, and we got it, we upgraded our vehicles, and things started roller coasting. Man, I'm telling you, just being with God, I was free, I was clear, I was strong, I was fresh, my mind was clear, my health returned. Before Christ, I couldn't go up a flight of stairs without puffing and wheezing and in the morning wake up coughing and hacking and how am I going to make it through another day, right? And now I can run up a flight of stairs. I, I can work. I work. I still work. I, I have a full-time job running heavy equipment where I live now. And, 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 and that's just the grace of God, how he's helped me get so much better. And that thing that I felt like I couldn't define that love stuff has just increased and continues to grow. And his blessing is true and real. And I'm a living, a living proof that he can heal you. Just have faith. He loves you and he wants you to have a relationship with him. He needs that in his life. He said everybody on the planet will have an opportunity to receive Christ as Savior before they die. Everybody will hear the salvation message and get an opportunity. Now, I was living in hell. 
and people say, well, you think that was hell? You think of your worst day on this planet. That'll be your first day in hell, and it gets worse than your own hand. It's not where you want to go. But his promises, and here I am, his promises brought me to this place right now to tell you that God is great, God loves us, God wants you to come into a relationship with him. Come, and just when I say serve him, that just means let him lead you in the way that he wants you to come, and he will teach you to serve. Don't count the cost, but oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, or stop this, or stop. No, he takes you just the way you are. Just standard, just the way you are. I was just a beaten down, dead addict in rags that couldn't lift his head off a floor. And he came and he picked me up and washed me clean and set me up for victory in Jesus' name. Thank you. And thanks to you guys for coming to my condition.